Very well. So last week we were talking about how uh, those who wish to follow our Blessed Mother are something like uh, Jacob, the son of Isaac and Rebekah, because uh, Jacob was the one that was faithful to his mother and to his father, but there was some movement of grace there that his father did not understand. And because of that, uh, Jacob received the blessing of his father. Some of it on the human level might seem a little bit crooked to us, how Rebecca said, your father just told your brother that he's going to get a blessing if he goes and kills a deer and brings it back and prepares it for his father and all the rest of it. But she said, you can do it faster. You just kill kill a kid. Go out and kill a kid. You all know what that means? That's, I guess, a baby goat. But if you tell it to some people who are used to saying kids as in human beings, they don't get it. So go and kill a kid and bring it back for me, and uh, I'll prepare it just how your father likes it. And, um, and then to make you seem like you are your brother Esau, we'll go ahead and put some of the kid's fur on your arms, and your dad, your father, will feel that because he can't see very well anymore. When he feels that fur on your arms, he'll think that you are Esau, and both for the meal and for the the furry arms, and also because I'm going to put some of the clothes of your brother on you, he'll think that you're Esau, and you'll get all the blessings. So on the human level, it seems a little bit crooked and conniving and all that sort of thing, but sometimes these stories are much bigger than what they are just on the human level. And sure enough, that story has a lot to do with you can never calculate grace, you see. Humanly, you can calculate this is going to happen, and that's going to happen, that's going to happen, and this will be the result of this, and this will be the result of that. And yes, humanly, yes, that works. You know, if you want to design a ship, or if you want to put up a building, or run a business, yeah, I suppose, yes, I suppose you can calculate. This will happen after that happens, after that happens, etc. But when you get into the supernatural world, then you get into things that you cannot calculate. And the story of Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, the two sons, Jacob and Esau, that story is bigger than just sort of the human trickery that it appears to be. What really is being shown there to us, and this is how the Catholic faith is so good compared to what those poor Protestants do, what's really being shown to us there is how the superiority of grace, how uh, you can't calculate for it. That boy, uh, Jacob, received a blessing from his father, and even his father, when he figured it out, when he figured out the ruse, because Eventually, Esau did come back with venison in his own clothes with his own furry arms, and his father couldn't figure out what's going on here. Then when, what's the name, Esau started crying, he said, my brother has fooled me again. And uh, the Bible says that um, Isaac feared, meaning he had given the main blessing to Jacob already, and there's, there was no way he could do the same thing for Esau, Saying, meaning that God, through this mysterious and unusual way, had made sure that Jacob got the blessing instead of Esau. And that was just the power of grace compared to the power of man. 
That's what was happening there. So now that you've got this uh, story from the Old Testament in your mind and how it has this very important message pointing to the New Testament, which is we will live in grace eventually. Not, we will not live according to human calculations. Uh, just kind of plug our Blessed Mother into the equation that somehow Rebecca symbolizes, stands for the Blessed Virgin Mary. And um, as much as humanly different people should receive the rewards, as much as in human consideration um, they should be rich and you should not, as much as in human consideration they should be the successful ones in this life and you should not, and finally, and as much as in human consideration, they should be the ones with all the blessings in heaven and you should not, our Blessed Mother can turn that all around, you see. If you just think of Rebecca, the wife of Isaac, somehow standing for and pointing to the Blessed Virgin Mary. So as we were concluding in our conference last week, um, the heretic and the hardened sinner show nothing but contempt and indifference for our Blessed Mother. Uh, to, let's see, God wishes Mary to be the mother of his children until the end of time. And so he says to her, dwell in Jacob, meaning, Blessed Virgin Mary, you're the one that takes care of the real, supernatural life of souls. You're the one that takes care of the whole life of grace in souls. And uh, you dwell in Jacob, mother of God, and you do not dwell not in the children of the devil and the sinners represented by Esau. There it is. Esau is the son of man, not in the sense that the Lord is the son of man. Esau is the son of men, son of this world, where Jacob is the son of grace and the son of God in the sense of he has the supernatural life in him. All true children of God uh, have... God for their father and Mary for their mother. Uh, we know how our Lord said very clearly to the Pharisees. He said, you have not known God because, because you do not know God because you have not known me. Our Lord also on another occasion says, no one knows the father but the son and those to whom the son, son has chosen to reveal him. Meaning, you don't know God without knowing our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe in the Old Testament, they somehow knew God without knowing our Lord Jesus Christ. But even then, they knew God insofar as they expected God to be faithful to his promise that he was going to send a Redeemer. So eventually that time came, the Redeemer was here, and he himself had to tell his own people. Imagine what a humiliation for him or what a, um, a sorrow for him. He had to tell his own people, no, you don't know God because you've not known me. Uh, he says that he knows the Father without knowing me, and he's a liar. Well, just take that one step farther, uh, in that we arrive at, you know, if, if Mary, if the Blessed Mother, is the one that's going to be distributing all the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to sinners, if Mary, our Blessed Mother, is the one who is the mediatrix of all graces, winning all those graces alongside of her son at the crucifix, there's no way that all that grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is going to get to souls except through her. You know, she, she's indispensable. In this, let's say, our Lord, he's the one who wins all the grace. But since he enters into this whole economy of grace with human beings, and he comes into this world through his blessed mother, and he take, takes on a human nature through his blessed mother, then she becomes an essential link for him to get this grace to us. So we can go to the next step. If you, don't, you don't have God for a father if you don't have our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, if you don't recognize, if you don't know our Lord Jesus Christ kind of as your brother. But you don't have our Lord Jesus Christ as your mediator before the Father if you don't have the Blessed Virgin Mary giving you all the grace that he wins for us at Calvary. So You know, you know the Father through the Son. You know the Son through the Mother. All true children of God have God for their father and Mary for their mother. Anyone who does not have Mary for his mother does not have God for his father. 
th those who say that God is my father and, and don't recognize the Blessed Mother are making a, what you can call a gratuitous leap. They're making a leap up to say, I know God the Father, but the Blessed Virgin Mary is not essential, an essential part of that. That's it to say that I uh, can receive all the grace that God has to offer me without making use of the means that he has chosen to give me that grace. No one can make that leap. And the Blessed Virgin Mary is that essential link. And take it again to our catechism story, or whatever you want to call it, our Sunday school story. Uh, Jacob would not have received that blessing from his father if we're not for Rebecca saying, now this is how you're going to do the thing so you receive the blessing. Uh, Jacob is like a soul who, because of the intercession and the, the mediation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, is able to receive that blessing from God. So let's see. Jacob, Rebecca, uh, um, sorry, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, just change the names a little bit and say God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the Christian soul. That's what we're seeing in that story there. This is why, so if you do not have Mary for your mother, do not have God for your father. This is why the reprobate, reprobate are those who are rejected by God, such as heretics and schismatics who hate, despise, or ignore the Blessed Virgin, do not have God for their father, though they arrogantly claim to have him. This is what I told you last week. It's, it's an unfortunate thing for the Protestant people. They become Protestants because they reject the Blessed Virgin Mary. Once they are Protestants, their punishment is to not have the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's kind of logical and paradoxical at the same time. Why would someone become a Protestant? Well, it's because they've cut themselves off from grace. How do you cut yourself off from grace? Well, you stop asking the mother of grace to receive grace. All right, so you become a Protestant. You think you have direct line to God, and you think you're praying so hard, and you're so in touch with God the Father, and you've got so much good going on in your life. But if you don't have the Blessed Virgin Mary there, you're kind of fooling yourself about just how much grace you're receiving. So it's both the cause and the punishment of a Protestant to not have the Blessed Virgin Mary. It causes it, and then as a result, one is left without the mother of God. And uh, they end up staying far away from God because they don't have her. It's very rare, very, very rare, that you'll ever find a Protestant that has some kind of devotion to the mother of God. And as a Catholic, we know that it's absolutely necessary. To say that we don't need the mother of God is like saying, our Lord Jesus Christ has won all that grace for us, but it can't come to our souls because there's no human mediator to bring it to us. That's, if we were to say, that, if we were to honestly think that we don't need the mother of God or the Blessed Virgin Mary, it would be something like that. Well, I know that Jesus won all the grace for us, but there it stays because there's no one to pass it on to us. That's how essential the Blessed Virgin Mary is. The only exception I can think of about some sort of Protestant group that recognizes the mother of God for some of her value would be the Anglicans, and I think only that is kind of historical because I don't think the Anglicans are really that influential anymore. You know, for all the Catholics they had to kill to make sure that their Protestant religion would succeed, they themselves were only operating about 5% of people who call themselves Anglicans, those are the ones who go to church. For all, again, they had to kill all those hundreds of thousands of Catholics to have their own religion, and now only 5% of them practice it. Goodness gracious, go kill someone else. If you're gonna, if you're gonna come down to five percent practice ratio, <laughs> then again, five centuries have passed, and I don't think the Catholics are practicing at such a high ratio either. But uh, so Anglicans, at least historically, somehow kept praying the Rosary. That would be the only exception. Uh, I think it's because when they broke away from the Church, they were simply a schism. They were saying, "We're still Catholic." But the Pope is not our uh, superior. He's in charge of Rome. There's no doubt about that. But Rome is not greater than England. And our superior is, well, it's really the king. I mean, the state ruler was the superior. And the Bishop of Canterbury, the primate, answered directly to him. So the uh, point is, it's very, very unusual and exceptional that any Protestant will give reverence to the Mother of God. And that means they completely cut themselves off from grace. 
they really completely cut themselves off from grace. We as Catholics have to be careful of that. Sometimes Catholics like to get along with Protestants and say that we're all quite the same because we're both doing what we believe in, and we even both have Jesus, something like that, when a Catholic is in a particularly ecumenical mood. But you just, if someone says that, or if anyone thinks that, they're, you, they've just undersold the whole means of grace, which is the Blessed Virgin Mary. You've just authorized having, sta having churches without statues or representations of the Mother of God. Well, you do that, and that's Protestant. You're saying, God and I have a direct connection. He won all the grace, and it comes to me directly. And that is not true. Our Lord Jesus Christ did not come into this world directly. He came through the Blessed Virgin Mary. All grace started in this world through the Blessed Virgin Mary. There's no way that grace is going to continue to come to souls outside of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And that's what it is to be a Jacob. All of us have to be Jacobs. The mother of God, the mother of Rebecca, she tells us what we have to do to get that blessing from Isaac. And if we don't follow what she has to say, we're not going to get it. And even, what's the name? Esau, who thinks he should get the blessing, he doesn't get it either because he's only calculating in a human way. So the problem of Esau is he's a man of this world rather than a man of God, and that's why he doesn't get the blessing. The problem with a non-Marian person is that he's a man of this world instead of a man of God, and he doesn't get the blessing either. So now with that review of last week's class, last week's conference finished and behind us, we'll start today, today's conference. Paragraph 31 in a book of 235 paragraphs. You know, if I were a computer screen up here right now, I would have the number 31 over here and uh, 235 over there. And that's how far along you've come. So, God the Son wishes to form himself and, in a manner of speaking, become incarnate every day in his members through his dear mother. Become incarnate every day in his members through his dear mother. That's quite a concept and quite a thought. I remember the um, rector of the seminary in the United States, uh, Father LaRue, oh, somewhere between 15 and 20 years ago, wrote a newsletter with his very concept in it, that the incarnation is an event that happened 2,000 years ago with our Lord Jesus Christ, the fruit of the union between the Holy Ghost and the Blessed Virgin Mary. That was the incarnation. That's to say, the entrance of grace into this world for the first time. But in a certain sense, that incarnation has to continue, and that incarnation does continue anytime any one of us does an act of grace that somehow the life of our Lord Jesus Christ being realized again in this world and having its effect outside of us. It's not the incarnation as far as, you know, third person of the Blessed Trinity takes on human flesh and walks in this world, but it is the life of the Blessed Trinity uh, being distributed to a soul, and that soul is giving the life of Christ to other souls. It is kind of an incarnation every time any one of us acts uh, on the part of grace. So with that in mind, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ becomes incarnate every day in his members through his dear mother. That's to say, all of us are receiving the life of grace, all of us are sharing the life of grace with other souls every day through the Blessed Virgin Mary. To her, God said, take Israel for your inheritance. Uh, that's a line from either the Psalms or the Canticles, sorry. But take Israel for your inheritance would mean all the supernatural life, all the souls that are my children, they are yours. Uh, you, you, that's your reward to have them. It's also your responsibility to make sure these souls receive the supernatural life and also get sanctified and go back to heaven. Take Israel for your inheritance. 
to the good, I shall be father and advocate uh, to the Blessed Mother. To the bad, I shall be a just avenger. But you, my dear mother, will have for your heritage, heritage and possession only the predestinate represented by Israel. So uh, uh, God is saying, uh, God is making as if to say, um, both the good and the bad belong to me. The bad I shall have to punish, I have to judge and punish. But you, only the good, only the possession, only the predestinate represented by Israel shall be your children. Uh, don't be too fearful of that word predestinate. That's not to talk of the heresy of predestination. Heresy of predestination was, I would say, especially championed, if we could use that word, uh, by Martin Luther 500 years ago. I'm sure other people believed in it before him, but he sort of made it bigger news. Uh, predestination goes something like this. God made us, and God, in the end, will judge us, and he will receive us either into heaven or he will send us to hell based on the merits of our lives. So far, so good. I don't hear, hear any heresy in that, but here we go. Now, God knows the past, present, and future. He knows what's going to happen. So he knows if he's going to judge his soul and send him to heaven or if he's going to judge his soul and send him to hell. Therefore, it's already determined. No matter what we do, we cannot change that judgment of God in the future. So just either be good because you're chosen or be bad because you're not chosen. And um, don't, worry, just don't worry yourself too much about it. And that's predestination. And that's a big problem because that view of God knowing the future is unjustified. I was just explaining very recently that, uh, yes, it's true, God does know the future. That's because there is no past, present, and future for him. There's just one big now. We're the complicated people who can't, don't know what's going to happen in the future, and we don't, there's, well, there's, there's a past behind us. It's because we're sort of marked by material time. Um, but here's the, here's the distinction. Just because God knows the future does not mean that he's causing the future. You and I have a big part to play in what's going to happen in the future. God is giving us all the grace that's necessary to save our souls. That's called sufficient grace for the theologians out there. And then depending on how we act to that grace, our souls are either going to be sanctified or they're going to be going away from grace. So you see, the ball is quite a bit in our hands as well to see whether we're going to go to heaven or go to hell. So this whole thing about predestination, it doesn't, bother, it doesn't matter what I do. If God knows the future, it's going to happen anyway. It's not, it's not that simple. God knows the future, and you and I still have a big part to play in how that's going to be, how that's going to be realized. I know it's a mystery, but there it is. It does depend on us. Not completely, but he's, because even when we're doing good things, we're responding to grace. Um, and just to let you know where some of this predestination goes sometimes and how we see it in modern society. This would be an especially an American thing because that was uh, Calvin and Calvinism had a lot to do with founding the United States in the 1500s and following. 1600s, more like. Um, it's kind of a Jewish mentality. It's something like this. If you notice that you've got sort of like material blessings, you have a nice house, you're not that poor, uh, you get a good education, you're obviously someone who um, would take care of people rather than ask to be taken care of, well, you're being materially, materially blessed in this world. Therefore, you're probably one of the chosen ones. God has chosen you for heaven, live a good life, and the people that are not as good as you, you don't have to treat them so well because they're probably going to hell anyway. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Uh, that's Calvinism. And I think a lot, that, a lot of that mentality has something to do with how the United States was uh, formed or born. If you ever read books by Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, some of these great authors from that epic, uh, <laughs> they speak of the people that were, you know, the, the natives of the United States of, of America saying, you know, the, the natural community was getting too large, so it was necessary that we move them. 
that's pure, you know, talk about racism, boy, boy, that's how things got going in that country. Uh, well, the Indian people, the, 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 the natural Americans before the Europeans arrived, I guess they didn't have uh, metal products. They didn't have a tech, the techniques for farming or husbandry that the, the Europeans had. So it was obviously God was blessing those Europeans more than the native people. So that means they were the, the Europeans were the good ones and the other ones were not. So it wasn't a problem if you moved those people off their land because they weren't chosen by God anyway, you see. <laughs> That's how predestination works. All right. I got a little bit off the track there. But uh, pre, if Jesus Christ, the head of mankind, is born of her, the predestinate, who are members of this head, our Lord Jesus Christ, must also, as a necessary consequence, be born of her. So St. Louis de Montfort has just, just used the word the predestinate, those who are predestined or predestinated. Now, it's not predestination in the same sense that I just described to you, the heretical one. This is a different one. This is uh, those whom I have chosen from the beginning of this world to be with me are going to be blessed. So uh, somehow God is choosing souls to be his special loved ones, and here comes the mystery again, without condemning others. Uh -huh. uh, those who whom I have especially chosen are the members of this head, um, are members of our Lord Jesus Christ, which means that they are necessarily born of the Blessed Virgin Mary, just as he was born of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So there's a mystery in there, I admit. It's predestination of the good. The good are called, but this does not imply that God is rejecting others. I don't know exactly how it works, but it's not contradictory. So, uh, Hopefully, hopefully, and I, I, I think it's obvious, we are part of this uh, predestined group. But I don't think that makes any of you look down on people who don't have uh, the same things that you have. For one thing, we're not choosing our, we're not saying that we're predestined because we have material blessings, as is the Calvinist style. We're saying if there is a predestination of us, if God has especially chosen us to be as Christians and sanctified and saved one day, uh, that's because of his generosity, and that's, that's going to be especially um, proven in the next life, but not in this life. It is not something that makes us look down on our neighbor for any reason. On the contrary, if we are, if we really do belong to this predestined group, those who are especially chosen by God to be sanctified and sa saved, this is going to cause us to share the goodness of our Lord Jesus Christ with other souls. But the main point here, which is not actually being the predestination thing, those who are members of this head, our Lord Jesus Christ, must also, as a necessary consequence, be born of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, in what sense are we born of the Blessed Virgin Mary? Grace comes to our soul, starting by baptism. Grace continues to come to our soul through the other sacraments and through the life of grace. But in all of that, the Blessed Virgin Mary is there. As she is the mediatrix along with our Lord Jesus Christ, she's the one who makes sure that we get baptized. She's the one who makes sure we receive grace. She's the one who makes sure we receive the sacraments. Now, what would happen if we were uh, members of our Lord Jesus Christ? He is our head. We are the members that belong to him but we do not have the same mother if we were to stop recognizing the Blessed Virgin Mary. This would be to be a member of Christ without being a member of his mother. And this, and not to use the word in a sort of silly way, but this would be a monster that is a freak of nature. The mother does not give birth to the head without also giving birth to the members of the head. Makes sense to me. So how could she give birth to the head and not give birth to the members? That would sound crazy. To have a head going around without any body, that would be monstrous. These would be monsters in the order of nature, a head going around without a body. In the order of grace, 
the head and members are born of the same mother. If a member of the mystical body of Christ were born of a mother other than Mary, who gave birth to the head, gets a little confusing here, he would not be one of the predestinate, nor a member of Jesus Christ, but a monster in the order of grace. So there it is. We don't want that. You know, if, if Our Lady is necessarily the mother of the head, that means she's necessarily the member of the, bo member of the body or the members also. Without Our Lady in our heart or my heart, uh, there would be no blessed Jesus in my heart either. Um, St. Augustine affirms that in order to be conformed to the image of the Son of God, all Christians are hidden in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, as the Son of God was once hidden in her womb. There they are protected, nourished, cared for, and developed by this good mother until the day she brings them forth to a life of glory after death, which the church calls the birthday of the just. So um, you've heard this expression before from St. Paul that he talks about his Christians saying, I am, I am in labor again for you all until the day I shall be delivered and you shall be in heaven. So he compared his own um, sufferings for the Christians. He compared his own evangelization of the Christians as something like a mother going through the pain or pains of birth so that she can bring them into this world. Well, St. Paul wants to get his Christians into heaven. Therefore, he's in labor for them again. Uh, St. Augustine says, St. Augustine says that the Blessed Virgin Mary remains kind of in pain for us Christians, protecting us, nursing us, caring for us until the day that we should be fully developed and she will bring us forth to life of glory. Those souls who are specially chosen. Um, and again, when I say specially chosen, these would be the ones who are responding to the grace that God is giving. There are a lot of people out, of, out there who are not responding to the grace that God is giving. In that sense, they are not predestinate or predestinated. The Holy Ghost, as you know, is the spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary. God the Father is creator, God the Son is redeemer, God the Holy Ghost is sanctifier. It is the responsibility of the Holy Ghost to take all that divine life, which is inside of the Blessed Trinity, to take all of that kind of appreciation of, and infinite, infinite love and gratitude going on within the three persons of the Blessed Trinity and share that out to all souls. Kind of makes sense because he's a result of the love between Father and Son, and love is something that keeps going out and out and out of itself. So there goes the Holy Ghost in a certain sense, out of the Trinity to share that life of the Blessed Trinity with us. It makes sense that the Holy Ghost is going to, going to be the one responsible for making the incarnation happen and the redemption happen. He's sharing all that goodness of the Blessed Trinity with us. Actually, the Holy Ghost is responsible for even creation. He's sharing the goodness of the Blessed Trinity with the whole world. But we're considering the incarnation and the redemption. It is the Holy Ghost's responsibility to make sure that love of the Blessed Trinity passes to souls. But how is that going to happen? Well, the incarnation has to happen so that the Son of God can walk with us and then um, shed his infinite blood for our redemption. But God always makes use of the means that he has at his disposal to um, kind of um, delegate everything at its own level. You know, priests are here, we're weak human beings, but God makes use of us because we're men and men can uh, perform the same rite of consecrating a host as our Lord did the day before his passion or the night before his passion. And we're very low and weakly, uh, low, lowly and weak. Uh, the human being who is a man who is a priest 
But it's an instrument it's that God can delegate things to. My comparison lacks a little bit because the Blessed Virgin Mary is not weak and she doesn't have sin, but she's the highest human being and God can make use of her to make sure his, his son comes into the world. And that's going to be between the union, as a result of the union between the Holy Ghost and, um, and Our Lady. So, the Holy Ghost says to Our Lady, my well-beloved, my spouse, let all your virtues take root in my chosen ones, that they may grow from strength to strength and from grace to grace. Um, this is what the Holy Ghost says to the Blessed Virgin Mary. God is operating at the level of man. So he starts with the highest creature of man, that's the Blessed Virgin Mary, with his union between the Holy Ghost and her, and that's how all grace is going to come to the souls. When Our Lady has taken root in the soul, she produces in it wonders of grace. She will consequently produce the marvels which will be seen in the latter times. So uh, everything that Our Lady does is meant to give glory to God. Everything that she does in souls is meant to give glory to God. Therefore, when the end times come, um, it is the work of Our Lady that will be seen in the souls. The Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, when he finds Mary in a soul, he hastens there and tries to fill that soul. One of the main reasons why the Holy Spirit does not work striking wonders in souls is that he fails to find in them a sufficiently close union with his faithful and inseparable spouse. So the Holy Ghost is all enthused about his union with the Blessed Virgin Mary. And as a result of that, we have the incarnation. But when the Holy Ghost finds souls where the Blessed Virgin Mary is not present, uh, it's not so inviting a proposition, so to speak. And therefore, um, great things do not happen in souls that are separated from the Blessed Virgin Mary. First, Mary, Mary received from God a far-reaching dominion over the souls of the elect. Otherwise, she could not make her dwelling place in them as God the Father ordered her to do. And she could not conceive them and bring them forth to eternal life as their mother. So she has a, received from God a far-reaching dominion. But none of these things, all these works of grace that the Blessed Mother is responsible for, None of these things could she do unless she had received from the Almighty rights and authorities over the souls. So uh, one of the things I insisted on last week with you is that it's true. Our Lord Jesus Christ is still obedient to his mother in heaven, even in heaven. You think, well, that's not necessary because the redemption is already complete. But they're still, they are still two human beings that uh, sanctified all of creation together. So... Our Lord Jesus Christ is still subject to his mother even in heaven. But it's not that big a deal. I shouldn't say that way. It's not such, such a difficult thing because Our Lady is so subject to the will of God that Our Lord Jesus Christ being obedient to her makes perfect sense. By being obedient to your, her, he's also being obedient to his Father. So Our Lady has received the rights and authority over souls because she is so obedient to God. So that's as much as I want to tell you this evening about um, the consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And now I'd like to go on a little bit with our story about St. Maximilian Kolbe. Uh, last week I closed with what he uh, developed and called his rule of life. And there were, um, oh, kind of like 10 maxims of this rule of life. But number 10 has about two or three pages of details about how he's going to follow it. Number 10 was, remember that you are the exclusive, unconditioned, irrevocable property of the Immaculate Mary. And that had about 
uh, two pages worth of consequences. You must admit that nothing is your own, but rather that all has been given to you by her. All the results of your labor depend upon your union with her. She is the instrument of divine mercy. So the story of St. Maximilian, as you know, started when he was a boy. The Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to him. She offered two crowns, white and red. Uh, he said, I choose the, the red one. That means martyrdom. And the Blessed Virgin Mary says, that's fine, but you're going to have to earn the red crown. You have to, you're going to have to do a lot of cooperation with grace in the meantime. So you'll get both crowns, but you have to start with the white one. So that when the end of St. Maximilian's life finally came, it's because Our Lady show, showed him at the end, now the red crown. And uh, he thought that was a great, a very great reward. Why do I tell you all that? Because from that moment, his vision as a child, he understood this, that nothing is your own. Everything has been given to you by the Immaculate One. All the results of your labor depend upon your union with her. She is the instrument of divine mercy. So for him, St. Maximilian, everything was coming from the Immaculate in order to give completely to the Immaculate. And when he eventually was uh, executed, he stretched out his arm for the uh, lethal injection. He said, this is for the Immaculate, uh, meaning there's not one ounce of my life that does not belong to you. My life in every one of its moments, my death, where, when, and how, my eternity, all is thine, O Virgin Immaculate. Do with me as you desire. So you can see how these... Um, Maxims, these, these uh, pledges, these goals of St. Maximilian were really finalized and realized when his death, death came about. All is possible to me in him who is my comfort through the Immaculate One. The interior life, first, it is entirely for my own sanctification and then likewise for the sanctification of others. So it's sort of like I have a debt, I have a duty to become holy because there are many souls out there that will not become holy if I don't. I owe, this, I owe this to God. That's the way he saw it. So that was his rule of life. And now we continue with uh, St. Maximilian as the editor of the Knight of the Immaculata. Knight would be the sense of the uh, K-N-I-G-H-T, the warrior on a horse, uh, the medieval warrior on a horse. And um, that's how he calls these men who want to work completely for the Immaculata. She's sort of like the damsel that they, they work for to save her honor. And they will go into battle for her. They'll even go to their death for her. That's the, um, the knight. So um, St. Maximilian came out of the hospital. And if you remember, he was in some place called Zakopane. Zakopane is a hospital and a sanatorium for the tuberculosis victims. And while he was there, you might remember, he was doing a lot of conversion work on indifferent souls and even a Jew that was converted. And the mother of that Jew was very, very unhappy. And St. Maximilian said, well... <laughs> Sorry, what can I do? Um, that's, that's the work of grace. So he came out of the hospital and went to Krakow. He wanted to start a bulletin to encourage enthusiasm, a publication. Uh, he was in the religious house of the brothers there, uh, the brothers of what? Uh, it was a Franciscan friary. And the superior said it was fine as long as he um, raised his own funds for it. He had to raise his own funds for his bulletin. So he had to beg, and he did not know what, he, do, he did not want to beg. So the first time he tried to beg, begging, he went to a stationery store and he was selling letters and envelopes and, and paper. He uh, got kind of cowardly, and he ended up, instead of asking for anything, he ended up buying an article instead. He got shameful, he didn't want to beg, and so he said, oh, can I have one of those articles? And he bought it and went away. 
So the same thing happened a second time at another store, but at least this time he had the courage to not buy anything. <laughs> the third time um, he went to another store, he finally had success, humbled himself, humiliated himself, and asked for a uh, donation. And actually, I don't know what happened there, what, he, what was given to him. It reminds me of a story, um, let's see, I was in Guatemala, and connected with our priory, we had a convent of nuns, Franciscans as well. And uh, they were very good beggars, these ladies. I, I don't think I ever had to pay, ever had to pay the, veg, the food for any vegetables because the sisters that went out and done, I don't know, Friday mornings and come back on Friday evenings with, with a ton of food. They would go to a market and ask and ask and this sort of thing. So it was, um, I guess each week, uh, I, I, you know, five sisters went out to beg but only one of them would actually do the talking. The other four were known to just sort of help collect the items, etc. But it was the responsibility of one of the sisters to actually do the begging. And I don't know what happened in the convent that week. They were kind of young girls, so they had some, uh, some forms of discipline that normally we, we would just have for school children. But they were young, so I guess it worked. Well, one of these girls, I can't remember her, right, her name right now, one of the sisters, um, she had misbehaved that week or something like that. She was, so she was under a punishment. I think her punishment was not to speak. She was not allowed to speak at all. But when they went on this day of begging, she was also the one that was chosen to be the speaker, the one to talk. So we have a contradiction here. But the mother of Superior said to her, well, for this apostolate, you must talk. I give you, I give you permission to talk. And the sister, so again, you have to understand, you know, depending on what kind of people we're dealing with here, um, she got kind of stubborn and said, she was thinking, well, if I'm punished, and I'm not, allowed, I'm, not allowed, I'm not allowed to talk, sort of like, how dare you choose me to be the speaker for the group for begging today? So she wasn't going to cooperate. Well, the mother superior didn't care. She said, just grow up, girl, and uh, behave like a sister, you know. So um, they're going around to the market, and they showed up <laughs> to, beg for, to beg for food. So there are five sisters, and the one sister who has, the sister has, has to do the talking is one that was punished not to talk for the whole week, but now she has permission and the order to talk. So they get pulled up to the, whatever you call that, the counter, and um, she wasn't talking. <laughs> and so we had an un uncomfortable situation. You have five sisters who arrive, one of them steps forward to do the talking and will not talk. And she's all, all she's supposed to do is supposed to ask for some food. So no one's talking. We have an awkward moment, and finally the sister says, well, are you going to give me some food or, or aren't you? <laughs> and the poor man at the desk was, sisters, I love you. I'll give you food, food every week, but all you got to do is ask. And, uh, and the dear sister, um, well, she got her way, but I think she got balled out for it. Uh, she got, uh, you know, rebuked, uh, reproached for uh, behaving so in such a um, mean way with people who were donating to us. So I guess even, you know, St. Maximilian Kolbe had a trouble also with having to ask and beg and beg. So he had to write all the first issues of the night by himself. No one helped him. And he called the publication Night of the Immaculata. When it came time to pay, also no one helped him. The superior rebuked, rebuked him for being an impractical dreamer. But... Um, to begin with, Father Maximilian, he was a priest already, he received a generous donation from the parish priest of Krakow, which is good, and then he went to pray, went to the Basilica of St. Francis to pray desperately. And he was there for a few hours just saying, help us, help us, this is a, you know, this is a publication for the Mother of God the Night of the Immaculata. We want to make her known so that she can make her crusade again in this world and pull souls out of darkness. And he's praying and praying like that. He had less than half the amount he needed for the first publication to come out. Um, when he was praying, he noticed someone come into the church and um, when this person was praying, they left, but they left an envelope on the Altar cloth. All right, so St. Uh, Maximilian finished praying, and he went up to see what this note was that they left, this envelope was that they left on the altar cloth. And inside the envelope it said, For thee, Immaculata. 
and inside of this envelope was, were enough funds to pay the rest of his debt for the first publication. So the first publication came out. And from there on out, from issue to issue, he never had enough funds to pay for the publication. But he told his readers that he could never, and so therefore he told his re readers that he could never guarantee the next printing. But the subscribers always paid just enough so that he, continued, he could continue the apostolate. And he had to give much time and energy to the fast-growing administrative affairs. So that's how the publication got going. I'll just talk a few more minutes here. Uh, so he's in this Franciscan friary in the city of Krakow. You know, that's the capital of Poland. You know, I'm saying not in Warsaw, is, but Krakow is a big city in Poland. And um, they were getting a little bit impatient with him, like, okay, here we got the friary. We do brother things here. You're obvious, you obviously have your own apostolate going there. And even though we approve of you, your apostolate is becoming more important than the rest of this house. So we're losing our, our identity. Uh, would you please go someplace else? So they did. They sent him someplace else. They moved him to a different place so that his work wouldn't be such a distraction to the friary. They sent him, sent him to the other country, uh, the other side of the country in a town called Grodno. And sure enough, there was no one there that could help him either. All the priests were either too elderly or occupied with other responsibilities. But there was a religious brother that they assigned to him to help him with the publication of the night. It soon became obvious to him that it was hard to print the publication in that city because it had a bad economy and there were a lot of strikes. So the only way he was going to survive was to buy his own printing machines because until that time he was um, outsourcing. You know, you make up your articles and then you bring it to a company to do the printing. But things were getting more and more expensive. He wasn't receiving any money to make the publication and he saw the only way they were going to survive was if he had his own machines. But this was impossible because he could not even pay for the printing from other companies for the moment. So he's thinking of the long term, big term, and he can't even take care of a few, a few more copies of the companies. Well, he located a printing press at a convent. He was given permission to purchase it as long as he came up with the funds, as always. He went to pray desperately to the Immaculata again. She helped him but only after Father Maximilian had to pass through a humiliation. So there was a visiting priest that came from America. At recreation, several of the friars started making fun of Father Maximilian for his publication. Uh, the American priest heard all this with them laughing at him. And uh, the American priest said, oh, what is this? They're all mocking you about something. Uh, I'd like to know about your project. And he found out about the project, and he made a donate, donation which was large enough to buy the printing press. Um, so they worked very hard. These, uh, the priests that started to help Father Maximilian worked very hard. Uh, and also this religious brother. Um, they had to obtain a different kind of time, type, type of printing press, and somehow he obtained the funds again. And then a mechanic of this type of machinery stored up, showed up at the door and said, I'd like to be a brother of the community. So uh, it was obvious that um, St. Maximilian had big uh, objectives what to do so the Blessed Virgin Mary could take a hold of souls. Uh, from day to day, he couldn't see how the material elements were going to be taken care of. But God was, our, our, our Lady, the Immaculata, was always sending people just at the right time, the right moment, to make sure that he could just go one more day or one more, one more week. And uh, everything kept getting bigger and bigger that way. There were more rooms for management, more brothers needed to operate the machines, it was a community within a community. By the year 1926, so that's about, what, uh, less than 10 years since the founding of the, um, uh, founding of the, um, the city of the Immaculate. Uh, since, sorry, sorry, since the founding of the, um, the militia 
immaculate. By 1926, they were at 45,000 copies per year of the night, which is quite big. And then Father Maximilian got weak again because of his tuberculosis. He went to the sanatorium. By this time, the press was paying for itself. Unfortunately, when he was at the sanatorium, he found that he found out that the fathers of Grodno, that's the most recent religious community he was at, the fathers there were looking upon the printing apostolate as a good means of income. We can live off of this. And that's not what the idea was. They're supposed to have the printing in order to help souls on the outside. So he wrote a letter to his brother, Father Alphonse, who is a priest, saying that the reason for the publication was to attract and conquer the entire world from Mary Immaculate. But to this he added that the curse of St. Francis would certainly fall upon all their work if it were used as a means to assure that the religious would have an easy life. So uh, he was very, you know, distraught about the misuse of the, um, the Night of the Immaculata. So um, next week I think we'll still have a conference and then the following week we will not. So we'll continue with the um, consecration and then the life of St. Maximilian next week. We'll say a prayer now.